general anesthetic is supposed to make surgery painless. But now there's evidence that suggests one person in 20 may be awake when doctors think they're under. While most patients will not remember, or remember very little, research suggests that 0.1 to 0.2% of patients will be fully conscious and fully aware of what is happening, while completely immobile and unable to alert doctors that they are awake. This is usually caused by the delivery of inadequate anesthetics relative to the patient's requirements and can have disastrous long-term effects on the patient's psyche. Canadian patient Donna Penner was one such patient who experienced this horrific ordeal in 2008 when she woke up during an exploratory laparoscopy. She was booked in at a hospital in her home province of Manitoba in Canada as she had been experiencing heavy bleeding during her periods. It should have been a routine procedure, but for reasons that are far from clear, the general anesthetic failed. Rather than lying in peaceful oblivion, she woke up just before the surgeon made the first cut into her abdomen. With her body still paralyzed by the anesthetic drugs, she was unable to signal that anything was wrong. So she remained frozen and helpless on the operating table as the surgeon probed her body, while she experienced indescribable agony. They um, put me on the, the OR table and um, the anesthesiologist put a mask on my face and told me to take a deep breath and I felt myself drifting off to sleep. The next thing I remember is waking up and thinking the surgery was over. I could still hear the, the OR staff doing things. It was They were, you know, banging, clanging, making noise as they were doing their, their work. And I thought, oh good, it's over, um, I'm okay. And then I heard two words that the surgeon said that just shook me to the core. I heard him ask for, for the scalpel. He said, scalpel please. And I realized that the surgery was not over, but it was just beginning. I could hear my heart rate on the monitor and it kept going faster and faster and faster. And I heard the surgeon speak, and he said, she's in distress, she's in distress. And then he called the anesthesiologist by name, and he, said, he, he asked him, he said, what's wrong, what's wrong? And one of the nurses spoke up, and she said, he's not here. And the surgeon said, what? And she said again, he's not here. So then the surgeon told the nurse in a very, very firm tone, he said, you go find him now. And I heard her leave the OR. Meanwhile, um, the surgery continued and I felt the surgeon make the first incision. I wanted to scream at him to stop hurting me, but I quickly realized I was paralyzed. But I felt him make each incision <clears throat> and and then I felt him inserting the instruments into my abdomen. I heard the doors to the OR open and close again, and I heard the nurse and the anesthetist return. He sat down near my head, where he's supposed to be, and I felt him put something into my IV. I, I don't know what it was, um, but it didn't make me go back to sleep. And I was lying there thinking, please, please, notice what's happening here and, and help me. But unfortunately, he didn't recognize the signs of anesthesia awareness. And I did not go back to sleep. And the surgery continued. There was nothing I could do. I tried to scream. I tried to cry. I couldn't even make tears. I, I could do absolutely nothing. I felt the surgeon moving the instruments around. I felt my organs being pushed around as he examined each and every one. I heard the comments he made. I knew um, I was in this for the duration. And so I thought, as all this is happening, um, I thought I was going to die. The pain was horrific. It, it, I don't have words to describe how much it hurt. And so knowing or thinking that I wasn't going to live through it, I thought about Brian, I thought about our children, and I said my mental goodbyes to all of them. 
I, I prayed, I screamed, um, anything, anything to get through it. The lingering trauma of Donna's ordeal can resurface with the slightest trigger, like the time she was waiting in the car as her daughter ran an errand, and realized that she was trapped inside. What might have been a frustrating inconvenience for most people, sent her into a panic attack. Or any tight-fitting clothing, particularly around the neck is out of the question she says. She still endures nightmares every night, and has been put on medical leave from her job. She has completely lost her independence. When Carol Weiher from Virginia was having her right eye surgically removed in 1998, she woke up hearing disco music. The next thing she heard was, cut deeper, pull harder. She desperately wanted to scream or even move a finger to signal to doctors that she was awake, but the muscle relaxant she'd received prevented her from controlling her movements. She was doing a combination of praying and pleading, and cursing and trying to scream, but nothing was working. The surgical tools didn't cause Carol pain, only pressure, but she said the injections of a paralytic drug during the operation, felt like ignited. She felt like she had been sent to hell. The entire surgery lasted five and a half hours. Sometime during it, she either passed out, or fell unconscious under the anesthetic. When she awoke, she began to scream. When Rachel Benmeyer was admitted to hospital, eight and a half months pregnant in 1990, her blood pressure had been alarmingly high and her doctor had told her to stay in bed and get as much rest as possible before the baby came. But her blood pressure kept rising. This condition, known as preeclampsia, is not uncommon, but can lead to sometimes fatal complications. So the doctors decided to induce the birth. When her cervix failed to dilate properly after 17 hours of labor, they decided instead to deliver the child by cesarean section under general anesthetic. Rachel remembers being wheeled into the operating theater. She remembers the mask, the gas. But then, as the surgeon made the first incision, she woke up. She remembers being conscious of a sound that was loud and then echoed away. A rhythmical sound, almost like a ticking, or a tapping. And pain. She remembers feeling the most incredible pressure on her stomach, as though a truck was driving back and forth across it. Every day, anesthetists put hundreds of thousands of people into chemical comas to enable other doctors to operate. Then they bring us back again. But quite how this happens and unhappens remains uncertain. We know that a general anesthetic acts on the central nervous system, reacting with the slick membranes of the nerve cells in the brain, to suspend responses such as sight, touch and awareness but they still can't agree on just what it is that happens in those areas of the brain, or which of the things that happens matters the most, or why they sometimes happen differently with different anesthetics. Nor can anesthetists accurately measure what it is they do. For as long as doctors have been sending people under, they have been trying to fathom exactly how deep they have sent them. In the early days, this meant relying on signals from the body. Later, on calculations based on the concentration in the blood of the various gases used. Recent years have seen the development of brain monitors that translate the brain's electrical activity into a numeric scale. For all that, doctors still have no way of knowing for sure how deeply an individual patient is anesthetized, or even if that person is unconscious at all. Thank you so much for watching this video and supporting my channel. To see more fascinating content like this, please hit that subscribe button and the bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next time.